very good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of the second book in the Reflection series, Reflections, uh, Lessons from Evaluation, Learning from the Past for a Sustainable Future. In the two years since the first Reflections book was published, at the height of the pandemic, the Independent Evaluation Office of UNDP has received such overwhelming positive feedback from so many of you that we decided to carry on producing reflection papers and making them a regular feature of our work. Since the launch of the first book in April 2021, the reflection series has evolved to continue meeting the needs of decision makers for learning on what works and what doesn't. Recent papers shared insight to support the implementation of the UNDP strategic plan and address topics under the signature solutions. The latest Reflections book includes 11 papers and 85 evidence-based lessons with inputs from 22 contributors. And I'm really delighted to have many of the authors of these papers with us today. These lessons were disseminated through 10 webinars uh, like this one with more than 1,200 participants in total. So it has been really a very important uh, learning opportunity within uh, UNDP, and we hope that uh, IEO really strengthens that contribution to knowledge management in the organization. The lessons cover three important areas of work for UNDP and for the whole development community. community. The first section covers the role of UNDP in supporting the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The second section uh, captures lessons from efforts to integrate the leaving no one behind principle, so critical for the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And the third and final section looks towards the greener and more sustainable futures that we strive for collectively. There are five key takeaways from these lessons that will be at the heart of today's discussion alongside how to apply them at the country level. And that's why we really welcome the participation of so many UNDP colleagues from country offices and regional centers who are joining us. Our aim for the reflection series is to provide relevant, useful, and timely lessons and insights based on past evaluations for colleagues everywhere we work. To carry on contributing to organizational learning at this level, this series will keep evolving to meet demand. Colleague, this is where we need you to tell us what you need to know, to tell us where there are gaps in your understanding of what works, what is not working, to hopefully try to stop doing what is not working. Tell us about the contradictions in the evidence you have seen. And that's one of the reasons why synthesis is so valuable, because we can really synthesize of sometimes contradictory evidence to see really in a systematic way what works. And uh, how can we make sense of all this information together? Therefore, I invite you to use the chat more uh, actively. During today's discussion, we would also like to learn how you use the reflection series, how you think it can better serve the needs of our country office, offices and any suggestions for improvements you may have. Please have your uh, contributions ready. Now, I would like to hand over uh, to my colleague, Sonjuhi Singh, who will take us through the five key takeaways from this uh, present cycle of reflections. So Juhi, you have the floor. Thank you, Oscar. I'm going to share my screen. Colleagues, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see. Okay, perfect. But if you can put it on display mm -hmm. mode, it would be better. There you go, thanks. Okay. Colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, and welcome to the Reflections webinar. So we are pleased to have you with us for the launch of the second book, Reflections book. Reflections is a series of knowledge products offering lessons from past evaluations of UNDP work. The aim of this initiative is to support UNDP decision makers, especially at the country level. And we are very happy to have so many of you from the country office participating today. Reflections are rapid evidence assessments that synthesize evaluations carried out over the past decade to draw lessons. So lessons are generalizations based on evaluation experiences with projects, programs, or policies 
that abstract from the specific circumstances to broader situations. Frequency, frequently, lessons highlight strengths or weaknesses in preparation, design, and implementation that affect performance, outcome, and impact. The second book, which contains all papers from 2021 and 2022, has been recently released. And here is a snapshot of the 11 papers that contain 85 lessons from, uh, less, uh, from evaluations. So moving on to the takeaway uh, one, it is that data-driven program design is key to success. Best in class UNDP program learns incrementally over time, integrating new forms of knowledge and leveraging existing expertise. Successful programs demonstrate a thorough understanding of the thematic and country contract context through various analytical exercises, needs assessment and evaluations, and utilizing and sharing expertise. Effective interventions also carried out initial analysis of barriers and potential hurdles for implementation, along with identifying risk mitigation strategies and enabling factors. Furthermore, experience from many programs highlighted the key role of detailed technical expertise, such as oceanography, hydrogeology, and ecotourism, and sound and methodologically rigorous exercise like vulnerability reduction assessments, rapid gender assessment, or village situation analysis. Many solutions built on traditional expertise, indigenous knowledge, and skills. Some of the good practices included appropriate land management practice based on local ancestral knowledge, which was the case in Uganda's cattle corridor project, where com communities ad adopted a practice of selective night crawling on bare soil using cattle deposits, seeds, and manure to improve soil fertility. In Botswana, the rangeland areas project successfully raised awareness on the needs for fire management, most notably through promoting changes in farmer behavior along with the donation of fire equipment, resulting in a dramatic reduction in the frequency and extent of bushfires and a major positive effect on vegetation regeneration. This example was highlighted in the Jeff paper written by Eduardo and Richard and both the authors are here in case you have any further questions. The second key takeaway is that success of UNDP interventions at the community level hinges on careful attention to immediate needs, localized presence, and customized attention to communication. Effectively responding to local needs requires combined measures to address long-term community priorities and immediate needs. For example, biodiversity conservation and natural resource management projects were most successful when they also improve food security and address livelihood and poverty alleviation. Successful local level initiatives also fostered community participatory process in project design, operational modality, implementation, and monitoring. These interventions also created and mobilized effective partnerships between communities, local authorities, and other key stakeholders. Additionally, the involvement of community-based organizations has proven particularly useful in articulating local interest. Together with other local civil society organizations, they proved crucial for geographic outreach, operating in local language, languages, and navigating local context. Understanding and reflecting the local context was also key in communication, awareness raising, information dissemination, and provision of technical guidance. Many effective interventions customized the format and language in which information was spread using local languages, contextual picture, pictures, braille, and voice-assisted technologies. A good practice from Georgia can be highlighted here. When Machakela area became a national park, the project secured the support of local communities by promoting the long-term potential benefits of Machakela area and potential ecosystem services. This included non-forest, uh, non-timber forest products, clean water, 
ecotourism and production of organic foods, which help ensure its success. The third key takeaway is that UNDP accelerates results or achieves more sustainable outcomes for women and populations at risks of being left behind when it pays attention to intersecting vulnerabilities and the culture and social aspects of marginalization. UNDP programs used a range of methods to identify those left behind, such as utilizing national identification systems or data provided by CSOs, obtaining mutual assistance information from traditional social structures, or applying specific assessment exercises. However, when identification was done on an ad hoc basis or based on donor preference, some populations at risk of being left behind were excluded or missed. UNDP work was often hindered by entrenched social and cultural norms and power structures that prevented those left behind from fully benefiting from the interventions in which they participated. Many initiatives did not fully recognize that some groups or individuals may be denied the agency to make certain decisions by their communities or families. These groups are also limited by structural marginalization that cannot be addressed by single interventions as it impacts multiple aspects of their lives. Evidence shows that understanding and altering these structural issues requires specific considerations in design and implementation phases of intervention, long-term substantive support and funding, and consideration for context-specific opportunities for structural transformation. I'm also joined today by the lead author for the paper on empowering marginalized population, Jin Zhang, who's happy to answer any questions you have on this as well. So in terms of country examples, some countries have de deployed initiatives to promote women's equality through policy and institutional changes, which have the potential to achieve outcomes on a wider scale. For example, in Malawi, the Decentralized Energy Services Project integrated a gender framework within future mini uh, grid programs run by the government. Similarly, in Mauritius, the removal of barrier to solar power generation project was part of gender energy collaboration with other ministries, right groups, right groups and representatives, representatives of women enterprises, pushing for system, systemic change. Um, more can be found on this on the access to energy paper and the development financing paper where we also have the lead author present, uh, Vijaya Vadevelu. The fourth key takeaway is that integrated approaches can lead to stronger and more durable results. But convincing partners to move away from sectoral approaches, approaches is still challenging. Many successful UNDP programs achieved results through strengthening linkages and creating synergies by simultaneously working at the policy level and with people on the ground. Integrated results were especially achieved when UNDP entered into partnership with multiple government ministries or included municipal level authorities, which proved conducive to overcoming fragmentation and promoting integration and inclusion. In certain contexts involving a broad human rights and equality agenda, UNDP also partnered with civil society actors who were able to link the voices of marginalized people with whom they work for national level normative processes. So in Fiji, Niue, Samoa, Tonga, and Vanuatu, water supply, sanitation, and hygiene, or the WASH program targets and implementation plans were mainstreamed at the national level and were given equal importance alongside the integrated water resource management strategies at the national level. So here combining the upstream and the downstream efforts. By integrating WASH program components with comparably well-funded integrated water resource management programs, access to quality of water was improved.
The last key takeaway is that sustainable development financing is best achieved through diversification of funding channels, including private sector engagement. By leveraging multi-donor funding, UNDP fostered the diversification of funding streams, which helped to strengthen national capacity to access multiple development finance streams and mobilize other investments. There are also some successful cases of leveraging private sector funds. For example, in the case of uh, renewable energy and livelihoods, there was also evidence of the potential risks stemming for, from misperception of the role of UNDP in application of market approaches over human rights advocacy. Fund diversification also included the option of adding fees, tariffs, or types of non-financial contributions to sustain establishing facilities, such as government one-stop shops, localized energy sources, or water distribution services. So, such approaches were useful when uh, the fees were transparent and uh, and when UNDP kept services broadly accessible, for example, by opting for non-financial contributions. Evidence from e-governance, access to energy and water interventions um, showed that uptake actually improved and relationships often um, got better when, when there were fees and services increased. Interestingly, Tariffs fees for utilities such as water services can bring benefits to users without causing exclusion from coverage. For example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, action plans for tariff structures were developed based on the valuation of the water services uh, up to the municipality level. In addition, the capacities of utility providers in maintenance work and customer relations were enhanced. This led to increased funds and technical skills to operate, maintain, and improve this water system, which in turn raised consumer satisfaction and motivation to pay. It further led to reduce financial loss by the water utility providers and lessened the need to raise future tariffs, which benefited the consumer. Contrarily, Going below the cost recovery margin negatively affects the sustainability of water delivery systems by building reliance on subsidies or external program funding. It also encourages inefficient water use by the end user and reduces ownership. So moving on, I would like to discuss reflections in 2023. This year, the reflection series will build on its niche of providing evidence quickly in a digestible format and based on stakeholder demand while strengthening audience engagement. The series will feature four papers on key topics responding to the organization's needs, one each quarter. Additionally, additionally, there is flexibility to cover two uh, papers based on requests, and we have put a request form in the chat. The lessons will be disseminated as short papers, webinars, and in new communication formats. The reflection series will evolve its approach and review its methodology with the use of IEO's artificial intelligence tool and other synthesis softwares that allow the integration of additional external databases to the analysis. To facilitate opportunities for collaboration with other UN agencies and development partners, IEO will continue to extract lessons from other open evaluation data sources as well. Colleagues, thank you very much for your time. I will now hand it over to the moderator, Alan Fox, for the question and answers. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sonjuhi, for uh, such a clear presentation. <clears throat> okay, colleagues, um, you have heard uh, the, the presentation. You also uh, have a, a link to the book where you can see the papers more in detail. 
And I want to thank the participants who have already put some questions on the chat. Let me invite um, Mary, Mary Noyoroge, uh, about uh, her question, uh, clarification question on the private sector lessons. Mary, do you want to take the microphone, please? Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, from Nairobi, is good afternoon. Um, my question is on, um, in regard to private sector, um, one of the takeaways, I think takeaway number five, uh, indicated that private sector brings forth opportunities and also risks. Um, I think from our programming, we can identify with you know a good number of, op of opportunities, especially in our decentralization program. But we wanted to hear a little bit more about the opportunities, I mean, the risks. And since I have the mic, um, with your permission, I can also make a few other comments so that I don't need to come back. Um, I like the whole issue of the CSOs uh, at a takeaway for um, bringing the, bring out the voices of, of the marginalized. And um, for me, this is profound because most of, you know, the, the name projects, it's more of government partners and emphasis on bringing in the voices of the citizens uh, you know, um, to, to be able to benefit more from the program interventions is quite profound and more so in all the, you know, the different stages of, of the program, design, implementation, and even monetary, you know, for me, I mean, for, for us, this is a, you know, a, a key takeaway as a, you know, country office. And then at the takeaway number three, the cultural and social norms being barriers to, you know, those left behind, those most left behind uh, from uh, program interventions. This again is quite profound. And um, I think for last, uh, our takeaway here is the need uh, to, you know, the, 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 the need for intentionality, if I may put it that way, in, um, in the project design, to ensure that these, you know, barriers are actually um, taken into account. For example, how will women benefit from a capacity, a capacity building intervention? If we don't have come with a criteria that, you know, you enable selection of women in an intentional and purposive way, they may actually not benefit. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity of uh, you know, giving this feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, uh, for the insightful comments and for your questions regarding the risks of engaging with the private sector. I will ask my uh, colleagues uh, who have worked on the uh, private sector paper to be ready to respond to Mary's uh, question. Uh, in the meantime, let me pass the floor to Shukrot um, from uh, the Kazakhstan country office, if I'm not mistaken. Shukrov, you, you, can, you have the floor. Oscar, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues. Uh, greetings from uh, Astana. I personally uh, thank uh, Tenji for uh, giving the opportunity to be connected for today's event uh, uh, and, and participate in the launch of this book. Uh, frankly speaking, I'm very privileged because uh, I've checked my calendar 17th of June, the year of 2021. I was participating and we were discussing about uh, uh, development financing and I was making presentation about my uh, 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 dear office of UNDP Turkey where we successfully implemented this one. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, today uh, I was... I was reading uh, very carefully with my colleagues the the, the uh, books that have been launched, and uh, thank you very much that you have very thoughtfully described those five takeaways because they are giving very 
uh, let's say, a comprehensive and universal recipe for uh, our uh, uh, intervention, uh, whatever it is, is it digitalization, uh, urban planning, promoting the leave no one behind through the localization of the SDG and other instruments that was uh, quite uh, uh, thoroughly reviewed and described. It, overall, uh, my impression after working with the, your dear office is that uh, you're always giving us the opportunity to look the progress with our CPD or with our uh, uh, certain programs from this kind of the focus of the outside, but with the professional eyes of UNDP. Another word that uh, it's really hard, you know, to 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 be uh, impartial within the country office. But once your team are coming and, and and bringing those kind of the vision, they are also unfolding our interaction with the national counterparts who, for some reason, shy to to share their vision with us. Personally, I enjoyed uh, uh, the takeaway of one because it was very. Uh, close correlate with the activities that we were successfully implemented with the year of 2022. Uh, it's about recovery uh, after the uh, COVID-19 and the leave no one behind. Because in this regard, we are very proud to uh, to, to to launch uh, jointly in partnership with the government of Kazakhstan the family digital card. That was the flagship project of the UNDP Kazakhstan that gave enormous opportunity for. Uh, uh, advancing the uh, transparency and accountability vis-a-vis -vis distribution of the public funds, as well as it gives enormous opportunity for uh, uh, local authorities to be more uh, 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 data-driven decision makers. So that is why I think it, it, it was a good uh, uh, initiation because the further development of the family digital car brought us and lead us to the development of the invisible government rather than you know going you know towards the e-government because i see that it is designed to prevent families for falling and be waiting uh, uh, to fill in the application through the e-government system and then you know no the system itself you know so by using the artificial intellect by using the big data it's kind of the making this uh, absorption and finding you know what are the people in, in in a very need and it becomes you know so natural that the uh, people are really really appreciating uh, this year we are planning to make the evaluation uh, of this project from the perspective that, you know, how it perceived by the population, what is the uh, uh, value added of this one, you know, for, for, for the, especially for the people in the rural area. And I have no doubt that would be the big progress. Another issue that you have raised here, it's about util utilization of the artificial intellect, because this book is, and, and gives us another vision how to uh, small pieces could be multiplied, you know, by other strategic vision and gives, you know, broader picture. Because again, you know, in Kazakhstan, we are aiming to make this uh, mm -hmm. regional intervention and make sure that these mechanism is in place. So that is why I'm, I, I'm, I, I would be uh, very much advocating among our people in, in the in the office to be familiar with this book, with the uh, repository of all this information, because it gives enormous and very essence information from the different angle of the uh, 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 of the UNDP as an organization. So in the summary, I would like to highlight uh, these two points. Number one, uh, this book is really practical uh, instrument. And number two, it gives an enormous opportunity for us to utilize the current competences and current experiences to, to scale up the activities and making sure that what we call as a valid proposition of UNDP, our networking, our expertise will be demonstrated very easily at this stage. Thank you very much and over to you, Oscar. Thank you very much, Sukra, <clears throat> for that thoughtful uh, uh, contribution. Indeed, uh, I think it's important to, to use uh, the resources that we have available now uh, with uh, in IEO and, and overall in UNDP to strengthen uh, the quality of our programming based on a better understanding of the context as you well highlighted. Um, let me invite Vijaya to, to address some of the questions uh, raised by Mary, not just on first on the private sector and the, the challenges uh, that and risks that we may face. Please Vijaya. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Oscar. Uh, thank you, Mary, for the uh, question on private sector. Um, I think we all agree that uh, private sector development and private sector engagement is very critical uh, for uh, moving forward 
uh, in terms of achieving sustainable development goals and supporting the partner governments. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think you're from Kenya office, right? Um, uh, I, I, th I think when we talk about private sector in our evaluations, uh, I, I, the focus has, is always being on to what extent UNDP engages in private sector development as well as private sector engagement. And we make it a little distinct from corporate social responsibility kind of an engagement of UNDP. Um, let me focus on the credit area which you specifically raised. Um, there actually there are quite a bit of opportunities for private sector development. And what do I mean by this? By supporting the government uh, to un um, uh, to unlock the bottlenecks in uh, engagement of, say, for example, um, uh, uh, microcredit institutions, uh, the enabling environment for them, the policies that would uh, help the, uh, the microcredit uh, micro institutions to grow. Um, and similarly, when we talk about MSME development um, uh, and other areas, which are again very uh, critical for entrepreneurship development and credit, uh, again, we are talking about uh, enabling, uh, supporting the partner governments in strengthening policies and, uh, uh, and addressing other bottlenecks in um, developing a very congenial space for uh, private sector institutions to develop um, and um, creating a very discreet environment for them. Uh, and I think these two areas, particularly in the areas of credit, uh, I really do not see any uh, any risks as such. Uh, um, uh, as such, of course, if the regulatory frameworks are all well in place, uh, I think there are more advantages than any risks. Uh, that's why we need to also simultaneously address the uh, policy environment. Uh, and when we talk about contexts like Kenya, the Kenyas of the uh, of the world, uh, I think there are very few risks, and that's why the emphasis on uh, in ensuring those regulatory frameworks are in place so that the private sectors do not take advantage of the situation to make more profit. Uh, so if this go together. I think the, the risk can be uh, addressed well. I'd be happy to pursue with this because this is an area uh, where our office has uh, put quite a bit of emphasis. We are having a current ongoing global thematic evaluation on private sector uh, engagement and development uh, with particular emphasis in the area of uh, economic development uh, and green economy. Uh, we'll be happy to further engage with you and clarify it. In the interest of time, I'll stop here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vijaya. Anybody else from uh, our team uh, would like to address this issue? If not, um, uh, there is a question for Sonjuhi in the chat about uh, the complexity, right? And how to deal with complexities and how the Reflections uh, book has addressed the issue of complexity. So please be ready uh, to uh, answer to that question, Sonjuhi, while I pass the floor to Magdalena. Magdalena, please. Thank you, Oscar. And good morning, greetings from Uruguay. Uh, well, firstly, I would like to, to thank you for, for the useful presentation. Um, of course, we share the view that evaluations play a key role in helping UNDP to continuously learn and improve its programming. And uh, specifically, we would like to comment on one of the key aspects of the lessons presented, uh, and we think it's the replicability. For example, I, we were involved in, in the e-governance uh, lessons and regarding lesson four on e-governance, in Uruguay, uh, UNDP has been supporting open government, digital governments and transparency policies since 2005. And UNDP supported the development of the electronic government strategy and the digital strategy, as well as the implementation of the digital government agenda, through which most central administration procedures have been digitalized. And many of these initiatives, such as the digitalization of administration procedures, the development of the digital medical record, the digital public procurement platform, and others, are, exam are examples of experiences that could be replicated and learned from. And I think that the reflections present a, 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 are presented in a form that allow us to, to learn from these experiences and a, apply, a, apply in our context. So, also regarding, for example, lesson five on e-governance, for example, Uruguay's online transparency platform for tracking the NDC progress has been recognized as good practice by UNDP. And many countries have, have, have expressed interest in its replication. 
But of course, it's very important to highlight that one of the most important drivers in Uruguay of the success of this uh, platform and, and is the robust climate institutionality and the stage of digital development uh, uh, we have in Uruguay. So of course, uh, replicability should be locally driven and adapted to national and local circumstances. So to conclude, uh, that's what uh, many of these lessons that we have in, in this book will be key for future programming and we very and we thank you for, for, for this opportunity. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Magdalena, for uh, your comments. Indeed, um, this is one of the challenges by uh, when producing the reflection series. On one hand, we can identify good practices in many uh, places. Uh, regardless of the topic that we are dealing with. Might be e-governance, might be uh, applying the principles of leaving no one behind, might be uh, really greening the economy. And of course, when we do the analysis of this uh, good practices, we see that uh, as expressed in the first takeaway, a very good understanding of the context is important because otherwise, those uh, initiatives would not have been uh, uh, effective or efficient or really relevant. And therefore, uh, therefore, how do we replicate that? What, how do we take that good lesson to a different context? Right? And that is indeed a challenge that we are facing. And that's why, why in some of the lessons that you can read in the book, there is some level of generality, generalization in order to be able to be applicable in other contexts right and so but that is indeed one of the challenges of the book in terms of trying to synthesize existing evidence about good performance in certain areas that can be applied in other areas by uh, tailoring it to the context right so uh, many thanks for your comment so Juhi, are you ready to deal with the complexity question hmm? Let's thanks Oscar. Yeah, yeah, let's yes, um, please Ram, I mean, that's an excellent question and something that we are all grappling with. And I would say in some way, of course, all our key takeaways connect to solutions for um, complexity, which includes evidence-informed solutions, which key takeaway one talks about, engaging with new partners, which key takeaway three talks about, and also in general considering long-term and short-term needs. Uh, I can point you to some uh, interesting examples that are in the book in terms of engaging with partners. So for example, in Rwanda, UNDP used a traditional long-standing practice and culture of mutual assistance, which is called Ubuduhe, to identify most vulnerable beneficiary populations and address inequality, especially in disaster-affected areas. And after Hurricane Mitch in Nicaragua, UNDP work with municipality using a participatory approach to select beneficiaries. And the local population was involved in the design and construction of 400 low income housing units and basic services for victims affected by the catastrophe. So I think if we focus more on engaging new partners, on co-creating, on using local evidence, that I would consider to be key to addressing complexity and something that's been discussed in detail in the book. Yeah, thank you. That's it for my side for now. Thank you very much, um, um, Sonjui, for that. Okay, uh, James Wagala, do you want to uh, come in with your question, please? Hello, James. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, good evening, colleagues. Um, I'm James Wagala from Kenya, and uh, uh, I think the reflection series is very useful. Um, I got an opportunity to clean the first one and now this one. Uh, they're very good reads. Um, my view is that they reflect on the programmatic aspects of the findings of evaluations. Um, what evaluations establish out there on uh, the impacts and the changes that UNDP programming is making in the field. Um, uh, one aspect that I would really be keen to, uh, to, to see uh, reflected upon is the technical aspects of evaluation. I'm aware that we have a methodological, methodological approach for uh, 
our evaluations. But even if we follow such approaches, there would be some lessons that we can glean from experiences in uh, conducting the evaluations themselves, starting from planning, uh, managing it, and finalizing the evaluation report, and even engaging the stakeholders. So I am of the view that uh, in the next series, it may be useful also to um, reflect on how can we improve the quality of our evaluation process and the utility of uh, the products, the evaluation products that we come out with by strengthening the technical aspects of evaluation. Thank you and over to you. Thank you very much. And indeed, this is a constant uh, quest for the team, right? In terms of improving the, the, the rigor with which uh, uh, we conduct this type of synthesis and therefore your comment is very much uh, welcome. Anybody from the authors that would like to uh, address uh, additional comment on that? Uh, I can ask her very quickly, yes. James. Mm -hmm. That's a, that was a great um, a great question. I think in the first paper in the book, we 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 highlight somewhat how evaluation had adjusted uh, to respond to COVID nineteen. Um, looking at sort of ninety papers, ninety evaluations that had been done between May. 2020 and 2021 but and, and we looked at you know the different constraints because of covid the, the 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 need to do evaluations virtually the challenges with not being able to work with beneficiaries and so on and so forth but i think what you've said there is really interesting you know we could take that a step further we could come back and say well lessons are coming out through these approaches but they're not coming out through different sort of uh, methodological approaches and I think that's really is something we could look at and examine going forward and taking a little bit deeper, you know, what is working in a evaluative way to draw lessons, not just for the reflection series, but for the organization as a whole. We look at the quality of evaluations through our QA, which is linked very much to utility. We have guidance, as you know, around that. But I think we could look more at, you know, what approaches are bringing out better utility uh, to strengthen our program. So it's a really interesting uh, thing to have a look at going forward. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, James, because that's precisely what we want to hear from you, right? Ways in which uh, uh, the IEO can improve its approach to producing these uh, rapid evidence reviews for extracting lessons that could be useful to be applied in our country offices. There is some provocative comments in the chat. Let me invite Dick Tinsley, if you can please uh, 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 Introduce yourself. <clears throat> Greetings and thank you for this opportunity to speak to you all. Uh, <clears throat> I put together a reference there and I have become very concerned that evaluations tend to be more of a propaganda tool promoting processes that have very, very limited acceptance. And I look at that, we can do a lot with aggregating numbers together and get some very, very impressive numbers, but you divide them by what the potential could be and they become back to the trivial. Uh, my example there is, uh, <clears throat> shall I say, a um, Ethiopian coffee contract that had 2,100 members. Very good to interrupt you, Dick. Can you tell us who you are? Oh, my name is Dick Tinsley. I am a emeritus faculty member in the Soil and Crop Science Department at Colorado State University. And my entire career has been working with smallholder farmers. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, can I finish my Ethiopia example for a minute? Yes, please. Okay, they claimed 21,000 members, marketed 121, 181 kilo, uh, tons of coffee. You divide the membership by the coffee and you get eight kilos per members. That's kind of a trivial amount to what it should have been. If you had the, if they were marketing everything through the cooperative, and, and that's sort of the example of where evaluations can become more propaganda tools than effective means of evaluating. And evaluations, the only real purpose they have is to guide future projects to be better serving the members that they're supposed to serve. Thank you, and I'll Thank you. be quiet at that. No, thank you. Thank you. Dick. I think it's important, uh, a reminder to all of us. Of course, we take to heart when you say that we're doing propaganda, 
we com completely reject that, that proposition, right? Because as evaluators, we really want to identify <clears throat> what is working, what is not working, what are the factors that lead to performance. We ask the question why. We do that uh, in an impartial way, really uh, triangulating the different sources of evidence, the different uh, stakeholders' perspectives of any given project. And from those evaluations, we have, well, plenty of examples that uh, you can find in our evaluation uh, resource center. So, uh, but it's good that uh, we have your voice uh, in this debate to remind us that uh, that's not the purpose of evaluation, to just make propaganda, right? But really to improve accountability and learning. And I see Sonjuhi also raising her hand to try to chip in into this debate. Please, Sonjuhi. Read, read the article, and I hope it can stimulate some thoughts in more in that direction, because that's really a critical thing to do is provide the guidance for future projects to, to better serve the clientele. Absolutely. And that's the only reason I get provocative. I'm Thank glad, you. I'm glad you did. Thanks very much, Dick. Sanjuri, please. Um, thank you, Oscar, and thank you, Dick, for that uh, provocative question. And I mean, while we did discuss a lot of positive examples of what's worked, uh, if you go through the book, we also have examples of what hasn't worked. So as a reflection series, we want to focus as much on learning from successes as well as on failures, and perhaps also do a better job of really communicating that how, because again, failure uh, is sometimes necessary for innovation. So we do want to make sure that we're working on looking at failures, that the organization is comfortable with us reflecting on it and learning from it as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, okay. Um, this uh, exchange is becoming uh, richer by the minute. Uh, we really want to hear your reactions to the lessons that we presented. Uh, how do we use the reflection series and how can we help country offices uh, to use this evaluative evidence uh, further? May I uh, invite some colleagues from other country offices like uh, Eno? Um, from Albania. Hi, Oscar. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm, I'm gladly following the discussion. I uh, and I appreciate uh, the efforts that has been going uh, into the book, and I also remember the discussions we had when we were doing the webinars uh, during the, pre the preparation in the series. Um, coming from a from a perspective of of, uh, of a country office. Uh, Evaluations is not one thing that you actually keep in mind and refer all the time. You know, we have to be also honest. We run so many things in the country office and evaluation is always something that you turn to when the moment comes, okay? Um, unfortunately, uh, it's, it's more of a let's say a process that needs to be done, then it's useful in the, um, let's say, in the preparation of new projects. It's always good to actually find out new ideas of what works and what doesn't work elsewhere. Uh, and it's, you know, when presented with the, uh, uh, let's say, with the presentation was made today, uh, actually it's very good elevation of the messages that come across from experiences. Because that's the moment that you realize that okay, I'm I'm supposed to do something here, but you know it didn't work elsewhere. Now this this uh, with this, what I want to say is basically uh, development sort of like has changed a lot, and I've been with UNDP country office here for over twenty years, and I think the development has changed a lot. The way we do business is changing as well, uh, is adapting, and uh, you know I think evaluations need to be, let's say, a little bit more, uh, I think it was mentioned in, in one of the comments, a bit more agile, a bit more informing to our daily business. And I, 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 I attend a lot of meetings, uh, let's say, for, from other agencies that say, oh, we've done this elsewhere, so it must work here, so let's try and do it here. I think we, as a, at least, you know, we're trying to sort of like shift away from the approach here, the approach that we're taking is more of a co-design thing. We have to do things in cooperation with our beneficiaries, with our target groups. And they, it's good to have frameworks, and that's where the reflections come in. 
because you need to know what the lessons are, you know, that you have to take into account. But eventually and ultimately, it will have to be based on the interaction you have with beneficiaries. We cannot just do like projects uh, formulated in, in conference rooms. Uh, we cannot just like measure, monitor, and evaluate, or even like in the end, uh, you know, by by just like meeting, uh, you know, our own selves. You know, we need to talk. We need the evaluation needs to be agile. It needs to be like part of the process of the implementation of a project. I know this is easier said than done, because you know, at the end, we all have resources, and sometimes in our big projects, we do have like uh, uh, evaluation, monitoring, evaluation uh, capabilities. We're trying to have one in the office now hired because at the end of the day you know we need to somehow shift away from this culture of oh we need to do this evaluation because it's time to do it and we it's in the system so we need to have to do it the evaluation needs to be like uh, adapting to the realities of doing business these days mm -hmm. talking more to the beneficiaries and building the evaluation approaches together with them just like we build the project and this is actually the, 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 the difficult part. And I think this is more the most useful uh, uh, reflection bit is. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anna, for, for that uh, reflection. And indeed, that's how the reflection series came to life. It was a, a need to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And at that time, uh, from the IEO perspective, we couldn't go to the country offices because of the global pandemic. There were no safety uh, situations for any of us. We didn't want to spread the virus uh, further. And so we resorted to what we had already in our databases and started to extract lessons from the existing ways in which UNDP responded to previous crises. And by extracting these lessons and sharing them, it got a great uh, acceptance. And we gradually move more towards uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning to do that process as well. And what you say about the ability to be more agile, the ability to be more responsive and to use evaluation when you need it. And when do you need evaluation? It's not when a final report is released. It's when you are about to design the new intervention, the new program, the new portfolio, the new project, right? And that's where uh, we, really have developed AIDA so that you can use artificial intelligence for development analytics and mine the data base that we have of so many uh, insights in findings, conclusions, and recommendations across the globe from uh, the Evaluation Resource Center. And I'm uh, putting now on the chat the link to AIDA where country offices can search for topics and, 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 and themes and really identify what has been uh, used in other contexts that can inspire you to do that better programming uh, in the future. But many thanks for your reflection. Uh, Ina. Okay, there were a couple of questions that uh, have not been raised, uh, answered yet. One of them from Martin Cadena, uh, and uh, uh, I will be asking to my colleagues to respond to that question. Uh, so, Juhi, Richard, please take a look at uh, his question at the very beginning of the chat. In the meantime, let me pass the floor to Armine. Armin, you have the floor. Dear colleagues, thank you for this opportunity. Very much appreciate the titanic efforts behind because just looking at size and the documents that have been synthesized and sold through, it is, uh, it's really not mm, easy to do. And um, actually, I would like to contribute to discussion because many interesting thoughts were heard through, through our discussion. Well, I don't know whether you will agree with me or not, but still we can find um, segments <laughs> in, in different sectors uh, or people who are afraid of evaluation. And this reflection series, I think it is very, very important, not easy to do, of course, but I very much support the position of Eno that he very clearly said that this talking is important and this reflection series uh, need to come. On the other hand, it was also heard how to make them somehow touchable, the ground and not generic, and even worse, not to make them somehow uh, hurt. Uh, some people might associate with as it was heard with propaganda even. 
Um, so yes, so I support that we need more and more these reflection tools that comes to prove that evaluation is, is, is a place or for, uh, for communication for communication. And maybe, I don't know whether you will agree with me or not, but I would in next um, iterations put in uh, boxes, cases, specific cases that come to uh, give gives a story, give a story and human touch. And uh, maybe there are people behind who want to uh, continue uh, more, sharing more their experience. For example, I, I look at the uh, this reflection series, the section on governance, e-governance, and especially its lessons learned on digital tools can promote open governance initiatives and facilitate citizen participation in decision-making processes, actually. Um, we are one of those countries who has to say this based in locally co-designed modalities and somehow we should think about the mechanism be able to continue the talk sort of yes lessons are there this is what we have learned it's over to you recipients sort of us readers we are around but maybe there's somehow to make them trigger and hook further give, I don't know, maybe open contacts or people who want to be contacted or willing to be contacted or these case studies that want to bilaterally sort of, it can keep the door open for further discussion if there is a, a need for that. And of course, which will promote that it's more discussion tool and uh, exchanging tool rather than uh, evaluators tells you tell you something. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much, I mean, for that uh, important contribution. So if I um, can see that, uh, you know, the, the, the feedback uh, from this uh, webinar and the presentation of the reflection series is overall very positive as a welcome uh, addition to the knowledge management in UNDP. There are, uh, however, the very important suggestions for moving forward including uh, this intentionality of um, uh, that was mentioned by Mary at the beginning and was not necessarily addressed for leaving no one behind and that uh, our interventions need to be more uh, explicit about how we link uh, the, the furthest behind in our uh, uh, programs and, and projects. Um, of course, uh, identifying better the risks and there are risks with engaging with the private sector uh, and, and uh, those need to be recognize. We have seen how important it is to understand better the context and uh, that better understanding of the context will allow the, uh, uh, the lessons to be more relevant uh, in order to tailor them to new uh, realities. Um, we also see the importance of being more explicit about the methodology uh, uh, underpinnings behind uh, this reflection series and really uh, uh, advance into identifying which uh, methodological approaches are more conducive to extract lessons or not. We have seen that it's important that uh, you, uh, evaluation has an, an important role to play in communicating shortcomings as well as uh, achievements of different interventions and learn from both of them, but they cannot become a pro propaganda uh, tool uh, for projects and that's really not the intention. Many thanks for the provocation. And uh, at the same time, <clears throat> we also see that there is an increasing uh, uh, interest in using uh, information and communication technology for improving the extraction of data and relevant uh, uh, evidence uh, contained in evaluation reports for improving our programs. There are many questions that were raised, not uh, unfortunately due to the shortage of time, we were not able to respond to all of them, but many thanks for engaging. We will continue doing so in the channels that we have identified where we expect your feedback on uh, the better implementation of this reflection series for improving our ability to achieve results. The development challenges that we are facing are more complex and interconnected and therefore require new approaches. From the Independent Evaluation uh, Office of UNDP, we are constantly uh, identifying and looking for innovative ways to address these complex challenges. And we cannot do that without the active participation of our country offices, of colleagues who are at the forefront. And before I close, I really would like to uh, take the opportunity to recognize the contributions made 
by so many colleagues to this book. Among the authors and lead authors, we have Richard Jones, Vijaya Badidelu, Ana Rosa Suarez, Ana Guerrajo, Ben Murphy, Harvey Garcia, Eduardo Gomez, Shaolin Shang. I also would like to recognize uh, some external authors like Andrew Five, Rakesh Ganguly, Claudia Marcondes, Florencia Teotisan, and David Wooston, as well as the great contributions from uh, Landry Fanao, Gideon Gisa, Elizabeth Woinar, uh, Anna Kunova. And uh, of course, I want to thank all of you for your participation in this webinar today. It has been really a great pleasure to interact with you. Uh, we will continue this uh, interaction in different fora. The next round will be in-person training uh, for m and &E focal points that is coming. Uh, stay tuned, Richard will be reaching out to you to say when we meet in person uh, uh, to uh, continue strengthen a culture of results and evaluation in UNDP. With that, colleagues, let me wish you a very good rest uh, of your day. Many thanks for your participation in today's webinar. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>